each other a little bit. That's good. That's a lot of what this group is about because it works better when we're all sharing this knowledge. The motto that we have for Chicago Ruby is when smart people challenge each other to grow, great things happen, and, and we can only challenge each other if we know each other a little bit, right? At least know each other's names. So thanks for coming out. Um, as uh, Bobby said, I'm going to speak with you tonight about Ruby and the Internet of Things. Actually, this topic is wider than just Ruby. Uh, I actually call it wrestling with the Internet of Things. We'll talk about some Ruby, but the Internet of Things touches multiple languages, multiple devices. Uh, some of the examples will be in C. IoT also touches Python. You know, some of you are from different language backgrounds, Java across the board. And let's get to it. Uh, we're going to cover a ton of material in about 30 minutes, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A, because the exciting part is when we have discussions with each other back and forth. So here we go. Here's our agenda. We're going to talk about why, what, how, and then Q&A. Why? We always cover why first because it makes no sense to, it, to do anything with any technology if we don't know why we're doing it. You know, that's, that's the core thing. So, and so why do we care about the Internet of Things? One reason is commoditization, or rather, we want to avoid commoditization. And in this context, what I mean by commoditization, commoditization is when something that was formerly very complicated becomes readily available to everyone. Something that was once very complex becomes something that everybody can do. For example, automobiles. In the early days of automobiles, you had to understand how to repair your own car because there were no car repair shops. And then over time, the industry grew up and you did not have to be an expert in auto mechanics to do your own, uh, to handle your own automobile. My name is Ray Hightower, as Bobby said. I run a software company called Wisdom Group and we run the Chicago Ruby User Group and a conference called Windy City Rails and some other things that I'll tell you about later. Um, another example of commoditization happens in our industry. You've seen what has happened with web development. Once upon a time, you needed a lot of expertise to develop uh, a website, a brochure type website. But now, anybody can go to Wix or to Squarespace or to WordSpace and get things done there. And if you're in the web development space, you better be doing something to move up the food chain so that you're adding value to whatever it is your clients want you to do and so that they pay you, so that they pay us, right? Because we're all in that business. So, we're going to talk about the Gartner hype cycle, or uh, I like the Gartner hype cycle. It is popularized by Gartner Group. They, some people say they invented the information technology consulting industry. The reason this is exciting is because this helps us to map out where anything we're studying in technology, where it fits. Everything starts off, there's the peak of inflated expectations, right? We get really, really excited about something. It's new technology. It's new. We want to jump on it. Then there's the trough of disappointment, and then eventually we hit the plateau of productivity. And that's with anything we deal with in technology. The peak of inflated expectations, the trough of disillusionment or disappointment, and then the plateau of productivity. Forbes magazine published an article where they said new technologies go through three phases, mania, bankruptcy, and then rebirth. That was in 1995, and they said it's mania time on the internet, because in 1995, that was mania time on the internet. Put another way, think about relationships with your significant other or your spouse or, or uh, whoever it is you're dating or anything like that. There are three phases, romance, problems, and then commitment. So that's with anything we go through. That's the Gartner Group hype cycle. Now, where does IoT fit on the Gartner Group hype cycle? Right now, we're in the middle of this peak of inflated expectations. IoT has been around for a while. The Internet of Things has been around for a little while. And now we have to ask ourselves, what are we going to do to work our way through that trough of disillusionment and then up to that plateau of productivity? Some things we, you know, we have to do. I think things together. Some with Ruby, some with C, some with just making sure we listen to our customers and do things for them that they need us to do. 
Remember online brochures? Remember when we were doing those back in the 90s? Some of you do. Some of you may have been born in the 90s, so you don't necessarily remember. But they were a lot harder. Now we have WordPress. We have Squarespace. And then so the strategy was if your clients were going to WordPress and Squarespace, you better be doing business apps. Uh, of course, the trend with business apps is back in the day when we wrote software before spreadsheets, uh, we were very much in demand, and then spreadsheets happened, VisiCalc and Excel and Lotus 1, 2, 3. That trend is going to happen with IoT as well. Here's some examples of what's going on with IoT. The first one I'm going to share with you is uh, an underwater submarine. Well, if it's submarine, it's underwater. That's kind of redundant, right? All submarines are underwater. This submarine is roughly the size of a toaster. Inside, it's got a BeagleBone Black running Linux and Node.js. And why is this exciting? It's called an, uh, a remotely operated vehicle, an uh, open ROV, because it's all open source. And this is for people who have some reason to do some type of investigating underwater. For example, say you own an oil company and you need to study something that's in your offshore oil rig. You don't want to send scuba divers down there because you're risking human life to do that. So you would send an ROV down. Back in the old days, you'd send one of these big rigs. This is a huge ROV. These remotely operated vehicles are millions of dollars. And they're huge. I mean, to give you an idea of how large it is, right there in that lower, oh, OK, that was not the laser. That was uh, back. In that lower left corner, there's the laser. That's a human. So this is a remotely operated vehicle that an oil company might use to investigate what's going on in one of their offshore oil rigs. And those are millions of dollars. Well, some guys out in Berkeley, California said, you know, we don't want to spend millions of dollars for one of these or, you know, $20,000 for one of these. We want to create an ROV that can be had for under $1,000. That's open source, where you can find all the schematics for it on GitHub. That runs Linux, and that runs Node.js. So that's, uh, that's my open ROV in my workshop with all the mess in the background. This is uh, a test. This is where I'm testing it out at Lake Michigan, giving it the thumbs up before dropping it in the water. And those are rocks at the uh, bottom of Lake Michigan. And what's remarkable about open ROV, you see it, it's all run You've got a Node.js app running on this device, and it's sending information to your laptop, to the web browser on your laptop. You're controlling a submarine through a web browser. And you can use your, your keys on your keypad, your arrow keys on your keypad to steer the open ROV, or you can attach a game controller. So now you're not playing a video game, you're flying your ROV underwater. They do actually call it flying flying your ROV underwater. And that's what it looks like. Hardware-wise, inside of it, as I mentioned, there's a BeagleBone Black. That's the device on top. That's a BeagleBone Black, roughly the size of a Raspberry Pi. Uh, and there's an Arduino. And there are electronic speed controllers, the three items uh, inside of the red, to, immediately to the right of the red rectangles are what are called uh, electronic speed controllers. Those are exactly the same type of electronic speed controller you would use if you do remotely controlled cars that you're racing around on tracks. The same type of stuff. And it's all done with open, out of, uh, uh, it's all done with off-the-shelf components that are readily available, and that's one of the ways they were able to hold the cost down. Less than $1,000 to an oil company that's accustomed to spending millions of dollars for an ROV, that's almost disposable. And here it is in action, underwater, with a scuba diver. Small and very effective, and you control it through a web browser on your laptop. It's open source. And when I was at the Open ROV company in Berkeley, California, I had a chance to meet several people who were involved in the manufacture, the making, the manufacture of the device. Here in this photograph on the left is an electrical engineer, a veteran electrical engineer who would work for companies like HP and Apple. On the right uh, is a pilot of human-sized submersibles. I mean, she goes down 2,000 meters underwater, risking her life to do the oceanic research that she does. These two, at the point when I snapped this photograph, they were collaborating on the next user interface for OpenROV. 
And what's more exciting than any of that, because I know you want to jump up out of your seats based on all of that, neither of them are employees of the OpenROV company. Those are users. It's open source. When I'm standing in that factory, uh, they mentioned, hey, you know, we're getting ready to do some tests on some new motors that we're considering for the next version of the OpenROV. And I said, well, I'll be respectful. I'll leave because the last thing I want to do is, is interfere with your intellectual property or see something secret that you're about to do. And they said, wait, Ray, you don't understand. It's open source. Come and watch the test. So if you're in that, their factory, you get to see the test for the next generation devices that they're working on. That's exciting. Software-wise, as I mentioned, it runs uh, Node.js, TCP IP, Socket I.O. I'll unpack that uh, real quick for you. Because it runs TCP IP and because you're controlling it through a web browser, you can, and this is uh, almost a quote from the, the owner. I, I don't have the exact quote, but paraphrase from the owner. You can control an open ROV in Barbados, from a laptop in Singapore. Because it happens over the internet. It's all TCP IP. It all gets routed through the routers of the internet. It runs Node.js, and Socket.io is a framework for designing real-time, bi-directional, event-based applications. So I'll unpack that. Real-time, it's happening right now. Bi-directional, it's happening in both directions. The information from the camera on the OpenROV is coming up into the browser so that you can see it. The information from your commands, left, right, forward, back, is going down from your laptop down to the OpenROV. So it's bi-directional. And event-based, I need to define what an event is. An event is anything that happens outside of your software that your software needs to respond to. Your software responds to something different on the video and it sends a different image up to your laptop or it responds to a command from the keyboard and sends that command down to the OpenROV. There are multiple event loops, three event loops that are, are at work here. Uh, there's one inside the browser on your laptop, that's inside of Chrome, one running on the BeagleBone Black, your Node.js uh, app, and your Arduino, your, I, I call it an Arduino, they're using an Arduino chipset on a board that they custom designed for the device, and that's running C++. Some people say, well, Arduino doesn't really run C++, Ray. It's actually a superset of C++. It looks like C++. So if you know C++, you can work uh, with the Arduino software. And there's communications between each of those event loops. You have socket I.O. going between Node.js and Chrome, and you have uh, serial communications going between Node.js and the BeagleBone and the uh, Arduino. I should point out, Chrome is actually the better browser to run if you're running OpenROV because it's based on, it's V8, it's based on the V8 engine, just like Node. So they tend to talk to each other really well. And if you want to see all the software, it's right there in GitHub. You can go there now if you want to. Uh, or actually, you should listen to me. Don't go to GitHub. But go, uh, yeah, you can go to GitHub now and take a look at it. And this is it. And a couple more shots. Second device I'm going to talk to you about is called Parallela. And here's a photograph of Parallela. It's roughly the size of a credit card or a Raspberry Pi or a BeagleBone Black. And this is it. And the case that you see, the black and the green, that's a 3D printed case designed at West Point, the United States Military Academy at West Point and 3D printed right here at Blue 1647 on the printer owned by that man in the doorway, Patrick Harris, so see him. This is a 3D printed case and you'll get a chance to take a look at this. This is Parallela, so what's the big deal? Another single board computer, right? We got Raspberry Pi, we got Bigabone Black, there's something called a Pi A64, there's a Pi, uh, a Pi Zero, there's so many of them, I can't keep track of all the single board computers that are out there. What's the big deal about this one? Well, it has 18 cores. Two cores are ARM, 16 are RISC. I'm holding an 18 core device in my hand right here. The machine that most of us use, the laptops that most of us use might have two or four cores. 18 cores right here. And you can buy this for about 150 bucks online. It's called a Parallelo. Very exciting. It's got RJ45 for your Ethernet connection. Power is five volts uh, uh, and at um, two amps maximum. Um, 
micro USB, micro HDMI, micro SD for the storage that where you would normally have a hard drive or a larger computer, you use micro SD instead. And that's it. That's the case I just showed you. And let's take a look at Parallel uh, doing something. You boot it up, it runs Linux. So you have a terminal window just like you would have on any other Linux machine and you have a web browser as well. But big deal, if you're gonna have an 18 core machine, you're gonna do more than just browse the web on it, right? You wanna do something else with it. Um, I should talk about the power utilization. One of the exciting things about it is that it doesn't use a whole lot of power. Uh, to verify that, I hooked it up to one of those devices. Some, you know, some of you may have those. There's a device that you can get that you charge your cell phone with. It's got a solar panel on one side and a lithium ion battery inside of it. You charge it in the sun, let it sit out in the sun. It puts out five volts at either one amp or two amp, depending on whether you're charging your iPhone or your iPad. And uh, I jerry-rigged a cable to, to hook it up to the Parallela and see if it would work, if, if five volts and one amp would be sufficient to power the Parallela. And that's a detail of the, the cable splicing that I did. And details on, on that are on my blog at rayhightower.com. And it works. Five volts, one amp, five watts, it works. Solar power. Here's the hardware. Inside, uh, I mentioned that you have the two ARM cores. That's where your Linux operating system is going to run and where your primary program is going to run. Your 16 core, uh, the, the 16 RISC cores are, are part of what's called an Epiphany processor. That's the Epiphany chip that's on the, on the Parallela board. And there are 16 cores. There are four rows and four columns. And rows are numbered zero through three, columns are numbered zero through three. And so let's put this through some exercise to see what can we do with this parallel that we may or may not be able to do with a Mac. Uh, one quick exercise that, that we decided to do is finding prime numbers, looking at all the prime numbers between zero and 16 million. Here's the program that we use. This is in C. And the key things that I want to point out in this program, I'll go over here, since I've been pointing over there for a while, point over here. Uh, notice that in the loop, inside of the loop that you are iterating, you're going over every other integer when you're looking at the prime numbers, because you don't have to look at the, 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 uh, the even numbers. You're only looking at the odd numbers. And we're gonna run this program first on the Parallela without using any of the Parallela advantages. So there should be a video running now, and this is it. On the Parallela, there's the elapsed time and the current number that we're investigating. We wanted it to, it to show us what number are we looking at to determine whether or not it's prime at that time. And it takes a while, so we're not gonna show you the whole thing. We'll let that run for about 30 seconds and then we'll jump right to the end because it takes a little while. In this example, we are only using the two ARM processors on the Parallela. We're not, we're not taking advantage of any of the Parallelism, but this is kind of uh, just our benchmark. So as you can see, it took 237 seconds, just under four minutes, to find all of the prime numbers less than 16 million. That's no Parallelism on the Parallela. What can a map do, right? In fact, we ran this on this, uh, this Mac that I have right here. Find the first, uh, all of the primes less than 16 million. We ran the same code, also, ran, uh, also written in C, compiled it and built it for OS X, and let's see what it looks like. So we make it, and then we run it. And it's much faster. As you would expect, it's a Macintosh. You spend a couple thousand dollars for a Mac, it better perform better than a $150 single board computer, right? Or else something's wrong. So it's gonna go through and it's gonna find all of the primes less than 16 million, and it did that in 14.4 seconds. It found 1,031,130 primes less than 16 million in 14.4 seconds. Now here's the fun part. What happens when we run this in parallel on the Parallela? In order to do that, we have to make a few modifications to our code. We have to call a library called ehal.h. That's the Epiphany Hardware Abstraction Library that we have to call. And we have to identify which row and column, which core we're sending 
numbers to to be examined to determine whether or not they're prime. So let's take a look. This is in parallel on the parallel. And let's run it. Oh, it's fast. All right, let me tell you what you're looking at here. All the way to the left, inside of the parens, that's row, column. That's which chord we're running on. That's the test. That's the pr number of primes that we found so far. That's the current number that we're investigating right now. And that's the square root of the current number. Because when you're looking at primes, you can only go as high as the square root of the number you're investigating. And it's done. And it finished in 18.6 seconds. It found the same primes in 18.6 seconds. So let's summarize our results. Here's parallel with no parallelism. Here's the MAC at 14.4 seconds and parallel in parallel 18 seconds. What's exciting is this single board computer for 150 bucks performed almost as well as a $2,000 MacBook Pro. But you don't want to throw away your Macs yet, right? Because this is an example of what's called an embarrassingly parallel problem or an embarrassingly parallel program. Here's what's going on. Finding primes is the type of problem that you can divide up into bite-sized pieces very readily. And because you can do that, you can run it on parallel processors. So it's going to do very well. If you tie two of these together, it will beat the max. So $300, it would totally, it, it would eviscerate the max. Where does Ruby fit in all of that? Because we're a Ruby group. One of the things that we did when we were figuring out the algorithm for the, for the prime numbers and examining the algorithm for the prime numbers, looking at it and figuring out what steps we wanted to take is we ran a lot of this in Ruby because Ruby is a language that allows you to wrap your heads around things like this very readily. And Ruby has a very tight, very fast uh, uh, feedback loop. For example, if you're using IRB, immediately you're going to get results, right? If you're using the uh, interactive Ruby on your console, you're immediately going to get results. Will MRuby play a role? I don't know. Uh, MRuby, for a long time, there was no activity on it. And then just recently, in November, there has been some activity. So maybe something will happen with MRuby on Parallela. Haven't seen it yet. Maybe someone in the room will do something with it. And of course, everything about Parallela is open source and readily available. So you may ask yourself, there's a couple of single board computers that we've talked about so far. What else is coming down the pipe? Well, look, there's another device called the Pine A64. What's exciting about this, look at this Kickstarter. Their goal was $31,416. At this point, they had raised almost $500,000. And as of two days ago, they crossed a uh, million dollars in funding raised for this board. It's a quad core board that actually costs less than the Parallela. Uh, it, it's a quad core 64-bit, <clears throat> excuse me. I have not done a head-to-head -head test with it yet because it's a Kickstarter and it's not really available, but it's something that we want to compare. So it's another option. There's all this stuff going on with the Internet of Things and all of these devices that we can use to control our robotics and all of the things that we want to do with IoT. So how do we do this? What are some ways that we can take advantage of IoT? We talked about mainly lab stuff that we can do with devices, you know, fun stuff that we can look at, you know, things that geeks and hackers and people like us like to explore. But what are some ways that we can take advantage of this? And when I say take advantage, what are some ways that we can do this so that we can earn some revenue from it, make some money from it, build some companies around it? Forbes magazine, I refer to Forbes magazine a lot because I get a lot of value out of it. They said, and one of they said, they observed in looking at the Forbes 400 that it's really the dull to normal companies that are making the most money out of this. You know, just the basic companies are doing the things that people need to have done. You know, not the, you know, exciting whiz bang companies, you know, we're going to send a rocket to the moon or we're going to put a submarine underwater, but the th companies that are just doing stuff that needs to be done. Amazon is a company like that. Amazon did something cool revolving around IoT. You may remember that Easy Button was, what was that Office Depot? Staples. Staples was the one with the Easy Button, where you hit the button and it just makes noise for you right there. Amazon, they took that idea, tied it in with Wi-Fi, and they have what's called the Amazon Dash Button. You run out of laundry detergent. You've stuck this to your washing machine. You run out of laundry detergent. You press that button. 
It talks over the Wi-Fi network to Amazon's fulfillment center, and you have laundry detergent at your door the next day or however long it takes for Amazon to deliver it to you. Now, some of you are thinking, Ray, I have a two-year-old at home. <laughs> <laughs> what happens if your two-year-old who likes to press buttons gets to that Amazon Dash button? Well, they, they considered that, and it will send a confirmation to your phone if you wanted to. And I would advise you to you know, have a confirmation sent to your phone. What happens when uh, it gets sent? Here's what goes on inside of an Amazon fulfillment center. <clears throat> These are robots by a company called Kiva. Kiva was an independent company until Amazon bought them. If you had a company that was providing robots for you that could save you a ton of money in your warehouses, that you could control through a web interface, an Internet of Things type interface over TCPIP, would you want them to have your competitors as customers as well? No, you wouldn't. You'd buy them. So that's an example of Internet of Things in a so-called dull to normal environment. It's in a warehouse. And it's not something that is whiz-bang exciting, but it's something that everybody needs, and everybody, everybody needs stuff to get done in that area. Here's another area, agriculture. This gentleman, Dr. Nicholas Braithwaite, uh, born and raised in Grenada, worked at Intel in Barbados, and I, I ran across him while doing research for, for this presentation. Remarkable thing, Dr. Braithwaite, uh, he's also uh, a, runs a private equity firm in Silicon Valley right now. And he's looking for companies to invest in revolving around Internet of Things and some other areas. One opportunity that he, he identified is agriculture. Agriculture is big business. It's dull to normal. Everybody has to eat. Big deal. I mean, did, how many people ate today, right? If somebody, everybody has to eat every day. So it has to happen all the time. And some of the agricultural companies, like your John Deere and your Caterpillar, are out there doing things with IoT right now. You know, if you want a device that's out and monitoring the soil conditions in the middle of your field, why not put solar panels on it so you don't have to run power cables to it? And then put a Bigabone Black or a Parallella on it and, and run Linux software on it, and, you know, there you go. Oh, and by the way, put a Wi-Fi antenna on it so you don't have to connect to it at all. That's all Internet of Things. It's not a drone flying around taking pictures of your neighbors or in their backyard or anything like that. And it's not whiz-bang fancy and, oh, this is so exciting. But yeah, it is because it meets a need and it makes money. Here's a heads-up display in one of the uh, John Deere tractors. That's exciting. You know, when I look at tractors out, you know, I'm driving down to Champaign-Urbana or driving down, you know, through... Uh, through uh, Illinois, central Illinois, through the cornfields. And I never think of all the technology that's on tractors today, right? When I think of a tractor, I normally think of something like this, right? This is what we think of when we think of tractors. So now I gotta tell you a tractor story, right? Because <clears throat> we're talking about Internet of Things, we're talking about tractors, we're talking about agriculture, and how, do, how does this all tie together? Well, a long time ago, there was a tractor manufacturer right after World War II began, be, began manufacturing tractors right after World War II, became very successful at it, sold a lot of tractors, made a lot of money, decided, I'm going to buy a Ferrari. Why not? Successful tractor maker, go out, buy a Ferrari. And he was driving his Ferrari around, you know, and, and it broke down. There was a problem with the clutch. He got out, looked under the hood and then crawled underneath the car, looked around, and noticed that the clutch on his tractor, or the, cr the clutch on his Ferrari, was the same as the clutches that he used in the tractors that he made. So he's a, you know, big time CEO, so he calls up Mr. Ferrari. He calls up Enzo Ferrari and says, Mr. Ferrari, the clutch in your Ferrari sports car is the same as the clutch that I use in my tractors. You can do better than that. And while I have you on the phone, you could do better with the steering. I think you could do something different with the steering. You could improve the steering. And, uh, and you know, the suspension system, I have some ideas and suggestions for you on the suspension system. And Mr. Ferrari listened to this for a little while. <clears throat> and Mr. Ferrari finally said, you know what, I'm Mr. Ferrari. You make tractors. Take your behind back to your tractor factory. You go make your tractors and let me make the sports cars. 
And so that tractor maker, he got a little bit upset by that, a little bit perturbed, and he decided, yeah, I'll go back to my tractor factory, but I think I can make a sports car better than Ferrari. And some people today say that his sports cars are better than Ferrari. That tractor maker's name is Lamborghini. And these are some of the cars that Lamborghini makes. And they also make tractors. They still make tractors. That's, that's one cool, I would drive a tractor if all tractors looked like that, right? That's a cool tractor. And it's all tied in with Internet of Things because, again, you're monitoring the activity on the tractor. In some cases, you don't even need a human on the tractor. You're monitoring the activity, the position via uh, GPS. All of the communication is happening via TCP IP. It's dull to normal, but people always have to eat. So if you want to jump on this, where are some places where we can jump on this? Uh, two places that I mentioned. I've mentioned this in uh, early versions of this talk. Blue 1647, my goodness, there's all kinds of IoT stuff going on right here, right now. Talk to Patrick Harris. My goodness, take a look at his lab downstairs. Uh, talk to Drew with his camera back there. He's over at Pumping Station 1. I, I didn't know you were going to be here today, so I mentioned it. Shout out to Drew, right? Talk to him afterwards. It's all learnable. Everything that has been learned can be learnable. We can do this together. We can share all of these ideas together. And we're coming up towards the end. Um, this is the agenda. This is what we talked about. Why, what, how, Q&A. We can do Q&A now. I'm going to mention one quick thing to you, something that we're, that we're doing around the Internet of Things here in the Chicago area. As you know, my team and I, we do Windy City Rails. We're also doing a conference called Windy City Things that is tied into the Internet of Things. And if you want more info, you can sign up for the mailing list at windycitythings.com or follow Windy City Things on Twitter. And thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, do you ever use um, a, like a cellular Wi-Fi connection um, uh, in order to connect to the internet? Oh yes. Uh, the question is, would you use a cellular connection for some of the things that we're doing with IoT? Absolutely. There, there are big benefits in using a cellular connection. The biggest benefit being almost everywhere in the U.S. you can get a cellular connection. One of the best examples I can think of uh, that's using cellular connections for their IoT work is Tesla. They're pushing updates out over the web. Updates for things like suspension systems. Used to be you'd have to take that back to the dealer and have someone get under your car and turn a wrench or something like that. But yes, definitely over cellular systems. Yes. Yes. Uh, you mentioned um, IoT peak of inflated expectations. Yes. Sounds, sounds reasonable. Yes. What do you think? Like, if we're in that kind of a place, is it a good time to start learning other stuff or start thinking about what the next step is? Or what do you do as a, as a business person who who works and kind of sell services to yeah. companies. If we're at the peak of inflated expectations, does it make sense to do something now or do we want to wait until we go, yeah, right? right. As a business person, where do you go? Um, if I'm at Great America on the roller coaster, the place where you're very close to almost getting some acceleration is right at the top and then bam, right? So I think there's, uh, there's certainly an advantage to being here. You know, expectations are here, but the thing that's going to get us to do that, the thing that's going to get it, it's not going to happen on its own. It's not, the, the time will pass, but the activity and the movement through the curve won't happen on its own. The thing that's going to make us do this is people like us in this room coming up with ideas to make that happen. So I would still get involved. I would, say, I would get involved with it with eyes wide open, fully aware of where we are on that hype cycle. That's, that's what we're doing within our company. Yes? So I think it's um, interesting, like Nest, I think is a pretty popular example of Internet of Things. Um, and we seem to be kind of like more and more individual devices that kind of hook up through your Wi-Fi, your phone. Is there sort of like anyone that's trying to think a little bit more holistically every device that's in your house, like you don't want a separate app to manage each of those. Is there sort of like a consensus on like a protocol or like a authentication sort of thing that you can kind of like add devices to more of like a hub as opposed to everything is kind of operating in isolation? 
Yeah, that, that's always a good question. Is there a standard protocol or standard language so that all these devices talking to each other so that they can talk to each other, right? You want some type of lingua franca for these IoT devices. A um, couple of advantages. Since it's happening all over TCP IP, we have some of that. We're, we're partway up the stack because we have TCP IP. So th the fact that it's internet is a big deal. The other part of that, the other part of that answer is that there are companies like Apple. Apple is ca calls their IoT system Apple at Home or something like that, or iHome or HomeKit. They have some name for it. If you go to Apple.com, you can find the exact name of it. But Apple has a standard for that, and there's some other standards that I've seen out there. I believe that it will consolidate, though. It has to, because somebody's going to be the big, you know, hey, you want to talk to all of our devices? And then all the engineers are going to say, well, the best way for us to sell more devices is to make sure we can connect to the maximum number of devices. So that's, what, that's what's going to happen. So yeah, I think, I think that will happen. I think Apple is certainly going to be a leader in that area. But you know, Google's got, you know, Google's got skin in the game. Tesla's doing some things with automotive, right? They have their standards there. So we may end up with multiple standards, but hopefully we only end up with a few. Like remember network in the 90s, uh, there were three main network protocols. There was TCP IP, which was up and coming, and there were two others. One was called IPX SPX, and the other one was NetBuoy. IPX SPX was by NetWare, and NetBuoy was by Microsoft. They're gone. <laughs> They're gone. TCP IP is, you know, rolled over them because it's more practical because NetBuoy couldn't get outside of the, the LAN and IPX, SPX, you could get off of your local LAN, but it was a pain in the neck to do it. So I, I think there will be a standard. And all, you know, for, all we, for what we know, we may end up getting an open standard that some of us end up putting together. Who knows, right? It may happen. Yeah. Long answer, right? No, I mean, <laughs> long question. Yeah, yeah, okay. Long yeah, answer. I think that actually highlights one of the big issues about Internet of Things is that there's a lot of vendors striving for some sort of lock-in. And, and historically, that's always been kind of a dead end because some people will choose not to lock in and then you move those customers to some competitor. And if there's something open that's appealing to all the engineers, they can all connect to that thing without paying licensing fees. Uh, so anytime you the Internet of Things, I look at it, if something's not open, it's a problem. And I already, I mean, you already feel that if you have a smart TV, right? Yes. Because some people have smart TVs and they've stopped updating. So your TV is now getting slow. Your TV is not working with the newest versions of some apps. You're getting errors. And historically, TVs lasted quite a long time for people. They're not really willing to update every two years. They're not going to get on an Apple life cycle for their no. TV. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. It almost makes you want to go back to your black and white TV, right? <laughs> well, maybe not. Maybe not that far. <laughs> you know, maybe go back a little bit. Maybe go back a little bit. Yes. Hey, Drew. When you were talking about the parallel, you mentioned something about Ruby, like MRuby or RRuby. Oh, MRuby? Yeah, I, I kind of blazed past that a little bit because I wanted to make sure that I respected everyone's time. MRuby is a very, uh, uh, a, a very uh, small subset of Ruby, and it's compilable, and it's something that Mats, Yokohiro, and Matsumoto was working on in the very early days, and there's some other people who have taken over the project. It's really designed for embedded systems. So you can find the, uh, all of the source for it is on GitHub as well. Yeah, so it's worth looking at. I don't know, I don't know what the future is. Like, um, if you would ask me, in October or early November of last year, I would have been very, I don't think I would have spent any time on MRU because I've seen nothing happening in the GitHub repo there. And I, I had also met someone who was formally involved with MRuby who said, oh no, nothing's happening with MRuby. So I had all these data points telling me nothing's happening there. And then on, I remember it was November 18th at RubyConf last year in San Antonio, Texas, an announcement was made is, hey, we've just added some things to the repo revolving around MRuby, so take a look. So maybe something will happen to it, you know, or, or happen with it, right? Or maybe it will happen with C, right? Because C is something that everybody learns when they go through their, uh, if you go through a computer science curriculum, you go through, it's more of a, it's more of a standard language in, in this industry, so, yeah. Was it for micro, microcontrollers being the target? Like, for it? Like it would run, run Ruby in a microcontroller? 
that, that was an idea. That was one, that was one place where they would run, right? But then, you know, Arduino really took off, and Arduino is really running like a, a hybrid of C++, right? And then you have Raspberry Pi, and Bigabone Black, and Parallela, and now Pine64, and they're running, they're running Linux, which means that anything that you can compile for Linux will run on those. And so people are going to lean more towards C because they already know it. So, yeah. So we'll you see what happens with it. You don't need it if you have Linux. You would just run Linux and then you would compile, right? Yes. No, I mean you can just run Ruby on it, right? Like, yes, yeah. You can run Ruby on Parallel if you want to right. do that, right? You can do that. And there's some experiments we're doing there, right? Oh, getting to the standards thing. There's some other things happening with regard to Internet of Things communication. Uh, I mentioned with the underwater robot how Node.js is the language that is used to write the app that's running on the robot, so you can control it with your web browser. Uh, using something called WebSockets that, you know, you have bi-directional communication going on with WebSockets. Well, the latest version of Ruby on Rails, Rails 5, which is now in beta, includes something called Action Cable. Action Cable is all about WebSockets. It's all about real-time, bi-directional, event-based communications. You see where this is going. You know, all the Node people are saying, oh, come to Node, come to Node. We're real-time, bi-directional, event-based. And now Rails has that now, or will have it as, as that comes out. And how well will it work? Uh, I don't know yet. It's still in beta, but you know, there's, you know, it, it's worth playing with. If you're doing anything with Rails, I would take a look at Rails 5 and Action Cable in particular, because there's a future there, I think. Yes? Have uh, some of these like, security concerns, how are those being addressed? Internet oh, security concerns? Yeah, oh boy. Um, <laughs> you know, what, what happens with a lot of things, with a lot of people in the maker community, in our community, is that we think of uh, security after we built something, right? Because you've got to get it going first. You're not going to think of security up front because you don't even know if the idea is going to work. So security is almost an af afterthought. But one thing I'll say is uh, the big thing that I like about devices like BeagleBone Black, Raspberry Pi, Parallela, Pine64, all of those single board computers, did I say that too fast? I feel like I'm talking too fast. The thing I like about all of those devices is that they run Linux. And if they run Linux, we understand the security model for Linux. Uh, for example, you know, this device, this Parallela, you, know, you can SSH into it, and the default username is Linero. The default password is Linero. And that's no longer the password on my Parallela. I'll tell you that, right? You change it with, you know, the, the Linux, you know, same Linux command you would change, use to change passwords on any Linux machine, right? And you can set permissions that way with, you know, chmod and all of that. So where security, it really depends on where the inventors are. Like, I saw a tweet this uh, last week. Someone said in the 1990s, all of our VCRs blinked 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 12 o'clock, right? They all blinked 12 o'clock because nobody knew how to change the time. Now in the 2000s, of the 2010s, and 2016, all of our routers have a password admin. <laughs> so there's your security. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, the question is, with all the microcontrollers and single board computers and all this junk out there, I'm embellishing your question a little bit, aren't I? With all this stuff out there, how do you decide what to get started with and what to use? Uh, that's a challenge. There's a bunch of stuff out there. There's a bunch to choose from. I'll give you an example of how some people have gone through the, de the decision-making process. In the case of the OpenROV submarine, originally they were planning to use a Raspberry Pi instead of a BeagleBone Black on the... Um, for their controller to run the Node.js app. And the reason they chose BeagleBone Black is because it just came out, it was highly available, Raspberry Pis were in short supply, you just couldn't get them. But this BeagleBone Black that was faster was also available. So that's how they made that decision. So part of the decision is going to be availability, cost is going to be a factor, uh, there are more costly, like this is, this is the most expensive single board computer that I've bought so far. I don't know that I would spend more than 150 bucks. I don't think I would spend more than that for a single board computer because it's an experiment. 
There are some that are three, five hundred dollars and they go higher than that. Some of the single board computers that are based on like the NVIDIA, the NVIDIA chipset, you know, those parallel chipsets are much more expensive, five hundred dollars or more. That's a little bit too much for me to spend money on for an experiment. Especially since you have a device like the, uh, the, the Pine A64, their price target is $15, right? And that's a quad core device, right? So all of those factors come into mind. I, what I would suggest is if you're making a decision about, about that, I would look at what's new and I would look at cost because that's always a factor because the cost of the single board computer that you use to design your prototype on, that's going to influence the cost of your final product, and that's going to influence how many people buy your product. And then there's someone back there who deals with products all the time, right, Patrick? That, that's his kind of conversation right there. Patrick Harris deals with it all the time. Okay. Oh, cool. There it is. See, you know, there's always, and there's always something new. And I bet next week you're going to have something new to tell us, right? Okay, there we go. There's always something new. Yes? Um, a little bit more ridiculous question, but yeah. um, so we're in this hype cycle, right? Yes. The, the ridiculous thing. Uh, is there anything that you see right now that you think we're going to be looking back and laughing at once we get to this? Like, what's, the, what's the pets com? Oh my goodness, what is the pets.com of IoT? Oh goodness, you're asking me to predict something and I'm being recorded, right? <laughs> so if I'm wrong, I can't like deny it. I didn't say that, no, it wasn't me. Um, what's the pets.com of IoT? I would bet it's going to be something that we want, that we think is kind of neat, but we don't really need. For example, I, I can tell you what it, I, it's not. It's not going to be something that's related to agriculture because we need to eat. It's not going to be something related to healthcare because we need that. Um, that's a, I, I can't think of a, a specific product right now that I think would be the pets.com of IoT. Let me think about that. That's a good question, and I should I should be considering that in our uh, business plan. But you know, the things that we're looking at are more of the things that people absolutely have to have, right? Uh, so hopefully we're avoiding it. But then if, if, it, if it's the pets.com, we won't really know until, <laughs> until, right? So, yeah. Hey, why don't we just all just talk to each other about this stuff, right? I'm, I'm having a good time uh, talking to you. So uh, we're, I think we're like almost out of time, official time anyway. So, uh, you didn't pull the hook out on me, did you, Bobby? All right, that's all right. Well, thank you for not doing that. So anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming out. Please continue to hang out at Chicago Ruby. Do you get value out of this kind of stuff? Is this good stuff? All right, should we do this again? All right, good. Let's make some noise for the video, right? Yeah, let's do this again. Yeah. yeah. Woo okay. All right. Thank you very much.